All right, hi everybody. So if you're in this room, I, I hope you like sex. If you don't, that's okay. That's totally cool, but this may not be the talk for you. So just, and that's okay. Um, I always like to say, if at any point you need to get up, you need to go to the bathroom, you need to go get a drink, whatever, you don't need my permission, we're all adults, just go do what you gotta do, that's fine. Um, so let's get it rolling. A little bit about me. So, I'm Kristen. I identify as queer and more specifically pansexual, which means I am potentially attracted to humans, kind of regardless of their gender presentation or their physical makeup, like it doesn't matter. That's, that's just how I identify. My preferred pronouns are she and her, um, but I'm not particularly strongly gendered. You're like, hey lady, and I'm like, oh yeah, me? Um, so yeah, gender with me is really kind of complicated. And we can talk more about that later if you like. My background, um, I have a PhD in robotics from Carnegie Mellon University. Yeah, I appreciate that. I live in Boston now and so everybody's like, hey, you know so-and-so from MIT? And I'm like, no, <laughs> sorry. Um, yay, CMU. So my work at Carnegie Mellon was largely in human-robot interaction and in educational robotics. Um, but these days, I do things that are a little bit different than that. So. Getting into what we're talking to, talking about. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is, what is a geek? A little bit, talk about that. What it means if we're talking about a sex geek. What is this culture that we would like to hack through being sex geeks? And then I'm gonna introduce you guys to a few folks who are out there doing really awesome sex positive work. And finally, the sort of broader context. If you start doing kind of public culture hacking in this way, what happens? And I'm going to share some personal stories and it should be fun. So here we go. I love this quote from Will Wheaton. If you haven't seen Will Wheaton's address to the newborn girl about what it means to be a nerd, like, oh, go watch it. It's fantastic. So being a nerd is not about what you love, it's about how you love it. And so, you know, conventionally say, if you're a video game geek, and I do like video games myself, um, if you say you're a video game geek, people will probably assume you like to play games. Pretty reasonable assumption. But you know, once we say geek, then we get into this whole other world. You watch podcasts, you're on Twitch, you're going to cons, maybe you're making costumes, you're talking to people, you're writing about the games that you like and the games you don't like. There's this whole ecosystem around it. Now what happens, however, if I stand up here and tell you I'm a sex geek? Your first likely assumption is that I like to have sex and you would be correct. I do like to have sex, as a matter of fact. And as a geek then, what does that do? Well, it opens up this whole other world. I listen to podcasts and I write about sex and I talk to other people about sex and I go to cons and I make toys and I also watch videos, like you do. And so what's interesting and we'll talk, so, so just by standing up here and saying that, it's kind of a political act and it has significant consequences in our society. And I will talk more about that later. This is gonna be fun. Okay, so what is this culture that we would like to hack and mess around with? Um, generally, mainstream culture in the US can be described as sex negative. What does that mean? It means that sex is generally seen as kind of a shameful thing. To some people, it can be a very sinful thing in certain contexts. Um, so you get all this really nasty stuff. You get slut shaming, you have this double standard where say women who have a lot of sex are sluts, but men who have a lot of sex are like studs. Um, we get rape culture, which kind of glorifies sexual violence, particularly against women. Really crappy sex ed. I don't know about you guys, I grew up in the Midwest and you, uh, of course, these days you get a lot of abstinence-only programs, which studies indicate. Turns out, telling teenagers not to have sex, not super effective. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, um, and you also, you get, so Al Vernaccio has a great TED talk on finding a new metaphor for sex, and you'll, I'll link to that in the post with all my slides. And he's like, you know, right now we use this baseball metaphor. So, right, sex is kind of this, this game, like you're trying to score and you've got to get to bases. There's like this order. And it, it sets up this kind of weird oppositional dynamic between the people involved, like somebody wants it and somebody else is gonna have to give it up or whatever. This is, this is a bunch of crap. So sex net of culture, no, no. What do we want? We want sex positive culture, aha. What does that entail? 
I mean, at a basic level, it's just celebrating the joy of sex, that sex is a normal, natural thing. Many people enjoy, some people don't. Aces, that's okay, that's totally cool. Um, that we're promoting consent culture, where we want people to be enthusiastically consenting, right? So you've got adults who are informed about what they're doing, they've talked about what they're gonna do, and they're gonna have fun doing it. Um, Al uses the pizza metaphor. So it's like, why don't we talk about sex? Like, you're getting together with somebody and you're gonna order a pizza. So you talk about it, like, hey, do you feel like pizza? And maybe the, the other person does, great, and if they don't, oh, that's okay. You know, oh, well, you know, I just had pizza. You know, maybe I want tacos. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> Not a big deal. Yeah, maybe you'll do Mexican. Maybe you'll do something else. But if you decide you're going to have a pizza then, then begins the negotiating phase, right? It's like, well, okay, what toppings do you want? What toppings do I want? Are we going to do like half and half? Like, and it's just, it's this collaborative negotiation where you're figuring out what you're going to do and you're both going to be hopefully excited and enjoy the result. Um, and then, of course, we need better, honest, you know, age-appropriate sex education that actually conveys useful information to young people, regardless of, say, their gender or their orientation. Um, those are the types of things that we're excited about and we want to promote through our sex geekery. So there's a couple of groups of people that I'm going to talk about who have done work trying to contribute to this culture change. Um, some folks geek out by sharing experiences and ideas, um, and other folks make things. Um, and these are both, again, these are really our geeky tendencies that we can leverage for the good in this, in this situation, for sure. So here's a few folks that I wanted to introduce you to, and I thought this was really hard to kind of narrow down, because there's actually, there's a huge range of awesome people doing really awesome work, um, but I tried to narrow it down, and I tried to pick people who I thought maybe you hadn't heard of before. Although the person who I'll start out with that probably many of you had heard of is the amazing Violet Blue. So she is uh, a fantastic tech reporter, a journalist, author, educator, advocate, has been, done a lot of great work on the NIM Wars, NIM rights. Um, the first book by Violet Blue that I ever got was The Smart Girl's Guide to Porn. Um, not because I wasn't already watching porn, which I was, but because I wanted to watch better porn, and, and that was really awesome. Um, one of her most recent books now is The Smart Girl's Guide to Privacy, which I think is really awesome and also kind of says a lot about where our society has gone like in the last like 10 years. Um, so she's, she's doing great work. Ms. Maggie Mayhem. So if you saw Johannes' film last night, you saw a cameo by Maggie Mayhem as one of the nerds, um, which was great. Maggie Mayhem is a sex worker out of San Francisco, and she's incredibly intelligent and articulate, and really can give you a, a perspective on what life as a sex worker is like. Um, she recently was in Occupied, which won the feminist porn release of the year for 2014, which is amazing. I haven't seen it yet, but it involves an encounter between like an Occupy protester and a cop, which is like rule 34, all the things, um, which is great. Feminist porn, I love feminist porn. So that's really awesome. If you only read one thing by her, go check out talesofkink.com, which is the story of how she got into sex work, um, which she explains is basically committing social suicide. And it's a really powerful piece um, and worth a look if you're interested in that niche of sex geekery. Cliff Provocracy is a geek out of the Boston area, so a friend of mine. And Cliff uh, has, speaks very articulately about feminism and BDSM, which is really cool. Some of Cliff's work that's really fun, Cliff does a series called Cause Mocking, where they take um, the latest issue of Cosmopolitan and go through the sex tips and basically call out the BS of like, okay, no, that is ludicrous. Aren't you gonna like get consent before you try that thing on that person that you haven't done before? Um, yeah, really hilarious and <laughs> kind of depressing, uh, but good stuff. Cliff has also written the, the Geek Social Fallacies of Sex. So some of you may have seen The Geek Social Fallacies, which is a great piece. Um, Cliff has the social, yeah, Cliff has the social fallacies of sex, which are things like, we can decide before we have sex that our emotions are not going to enter into it and nothing will change. Yeah, no, does not work that way. Um, so some really insightful thinking, particularly into the sexuality of geeks, um, and that's just, just great rating. Um, the last person before I introduce, I don't know if anybody recognizes this. This was the first sex toy that I ever made. I took a class at Artisan's Asylum, which is my local makerspace in Somerville, and I was friends with the instructor, and I said, 
you realize I want to exit your class with the maximum number of fuckable objects. <laughs> and he was like, okay. So everybody else, first project, made a candle. I made a butt plug. Final projects were of a range of nice sculptures, and I made a copy of my favorite dildo, and I put a little tiny TARDIS inside it. And this toy I actually dedicated to uh, Kate Bornstein. So Kate Bornstein is a geek of all geeks. She's got like Neil Gaiman sleeve on one side. She's got Doctor Who, Battlestar Galactica tattoos. Um, really geeks out about gender, um, being transgender, the trans experience. Does a lot of awesome work supporting what she calls like gender outlaws, um, young LGBTQ people. Is amazing. So if you want to kind of geek out about gender, like. Um, they've done amazing writing. I love her business card. I am so honored to like have gotten one of her business cards. It's a get out of hell free card. And she hands it to you and you read it and it's basically like, if you're ever sent to hell, not for being mean to somebody, but just for being yourself or loving who you love, if that gets you sent to hell, Auntie Kate will serve that time for you. It's totally awesome. So for a whole community of young queer and trans, especially trans and gender queer folk, like if you, if you need an auntie, like auntie, like th that is how we tweet to her. Auntie Kate, I love you, you know, totally. Amazing person, great writing, definitely check her out. Um, and so what about people who make things? Because we're definitely a conference of geeks here who like to make things. Um, this is my friend, Dr. Extreme. Dr. Extreme is, has a PhD in physics and basically takes a, applied physics to sex toys and it is totally amazing and just fantastic. So the toy on the, on the left there, that was his first one, the X1 Orgasmatron. And basically he was like, we're gonna use the, the principle of impedance matching. So the deal is, right, most vibrators have a little tiny, like, weight that you're spinning around, right? Now, it turns out that if you're trying to move something like, say, the clitoris, which while in, uh, externally can be fairly small, internally there is a lot of tissue there, you've got, it's, it's like you're trying to hit a bowling ball with a badminton racket. Why would you do that? So his, his X1 has basically this huge mass inside it. So you pick up the toy, and like if you've ever used, say, a Hitachi magic wand, like you put that on your palm, and like, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of buzzing going on, that's nice. You, you pick up the X1 and turn it on, and like your entire arm is shaking. <laughs> I'm like, ah, physics. This is the power of the science. He's great. Um, the middle thing there, that is the hack off. That is his open hardware project to make it really easy to control a vibrator from an Arduino. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Um, and then the last one, the purple toy, this is his new one he's crowdfunding now, the Ambrosia. He calls this the bionic dildo because he's basically got a pressure sensor in the shaft. So it can sense when it's being like stroked um, or sucked on, so rhythmic motion then gets translated to the little bullet vibe. So you could actually like have a strap on and get some sensory response, like kind of relating to what's happening to your strap on. Yeah, it's it's awesome, right? And it's all it's all physics. He's great. He'll he he um he gave a demo of this at the last Ars Electronica, and he's like got all the equations, and it's just like whoa. I totally I was I personally was not great at physics, so I admire the folks who are and, and do fun stuff like this. Um, some of you may have seen Mike Elizabeth Scott's piece, Hacking My Vagina. So she really wanted to build a hands-free vibrator controller and happened to have a sonar sensor around and like has documented on her blog like all the things she did. And the thing, the thing about this is you've got her sensor here and then you end up with this kind of crazy like haptic um, field around it. So like as you sort of get your hand closer to the sensor, then the vibrator starts activating and you can kind of play around with the region of activation. So it's great. She's like, it's hands-free. Um, again, just another really cool project, fun stuff. So Tina Gong is actually local here in New York. I just found out about her work. So this, this by the way, is Tina's um, like self-portrait on the left. And on the right, this is Happy. Happy is the most adorable cartoon vulva I have ever seen. <laughs> Hands down, totally amazing. So Tina wrote an app called Happy Playtime that is designed to be an educational app um, for women, cisgendered women, to talk about masturbation. Because again, we live in a society where I feel like we have kind of a lot of cultural references and jokes about guys jacking off, but women, like, 
not so much, even though it's totally a thing that women and a lot of people like to do. And so she's built this educational app to try and kind of provide ideas and feedback and information to women um, and submitted it to Apple and it was denied. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Yeah, it's, it's really sucky. Um, and so she is reworking it as a web app. So I, am, I will be anxiously following the progress. So it's like whether you work with software or hardware, like there are totally geeky, fun, awesome, sex positive things you can be doing. Um, so as for myself, I got started because I was really interested in inspiring people to not just sort of use the stuff that you can get off the shelf, but, but really start to make and hack and find ways to make your own sex life better, to have the kinds of experiences you want to have. My goal is to make a sex toy or a piece of BDSM equipment at ev using every workshop at my makerspace. So here we've got a prototype. So a friend of mine came up with the idea of a movable type paddle. <laughs> Some folks may be aware you can buy implements that have a word printed on them. You can print that word on other people, but why would you want to print the same word over and over? <laughs> I mean, bitch is great, but like after a while, it gets old. So, so that is uh, that prototype totally does not work. But you know, oh yeah, it's prototype. Totally no, not not good. Um, I have played around with using Sugru as a way to help like fix and make some of my that's my favorite bunny. Make that a little more stable. Um, we have lamp glass working. So what you're seeing there on the bottom is a Barbie scale glass dildo. We didn't have torches big enough for like human scale glass toys. And I was like, what am I gonna do? And then I'm like, Barbie. What does Barbie really need? She really needs a glass strap on, as it turns out. Um, and we have a screen printing shop, so I made a cool um, transpositive shirt. So it's, it's been a really interesting journey. The toy that I have made that has definitely gotten me the most attention is called the hammer. So, oh, some people, may, some people may have seen it before. So the hammer, the first version of the hammer um, was one solid piece and had some sensing. And the idea was going to be that you could squeeze your PC muscles and light it up. So like a test your strength game. It would, and, and you can see the video. It, it would work, but the trick was the sensor was not really, it, you know, it was like, you know, you get cheap or easy or it works. Like pick two of the three, I got cheap and easy. <laughs> it doesn't really work. Um, but, but so it goes. So when those prototypes died, I was about to go to Burning Man. I was like, I can't go to Burning Man without a glowing sex toy. <laughs> so the next edition of the hammer was born. And if the God, if the demo gods smile upon me, will they? Yeah. <laughs> I can, let's see if I can swing this around. All right. So now, what I love is at this point in the talk, it does not matter what I say. <laughs> that's, and that's okay with me. It gives me a couple minutes to collect my thoughts while we just enjoy the glowing rainbow penis. I actually believe, I would like to declare, by the way, that all dick-waving contests are now over. <laughs> I win. <laughs> and we can now just move on as a society. This, yeah, this is it. So this is 25 of Adafruit's NeoPixels. I love Adafruit. Um, I love Adafruit. So this is, this is Adafruit NeoPixels like you have never seen them before. Um, silicone, it turns out, is really great for the dispersion of the light. Um, and this is hooked up to the, like, a custom little shield in Arduino that I happen to have around. Um, and Jimmy Rogers of the hardware hacking area downstairs helped do a lot of these electronics. And, you know, shout out to him. He's amazing. So, yeah, this was kind of what I started to do. And, yeah, it was, it's, it's, been, it's been a blast. This was named Crack.com's number one geekiest sex toy of all time. And I was like, wow. You know, after my PhD, that's... that's that's a pretty good accomplishment right there. I'll, I'll take that. Sure. So, so then my journey was like, OK, make hilarious sex toy. And then, well, I'd like to get it manufactured. OK, well, I'm going to need a company. OK, but so I'm going to need to fundraise, because hardware is expensive, right? Hardware sucks. Be great if I could crowdfund. And this was a couple years ago when Indiegogo and Kickstarter were kicking off sex toys. You could not use Kickstarter and Indiegogo and most of the most 
extant platforms to do crowdfunding. Um, so I was like, okay, I'm gonna have to build a crowdfunding platform. All right, I'm gonna build a crowdfunding platform. All right, so I'm gonna need some developers. I'm gonna have to figure out what I'm gonna do about a code base. Oh, hey, there's this open source project that I'm gonna have to uh, start futzing with. And there I was. And there I was with my yak. And all right, I'm sorry guys, I'm gonna have to sneak back over here to get my slides. You can look at my penis more later if you like afterwards, that's, that's okay. So, and I actually realized as I got going, I, I kind of fell in love with the yak I was shaving <laughs> because I realized, so it wasn't just about you know, me making one toy. I mean, that's cool, that's fun. And I appreciate how many people get a kick out of this and laugh because you know what? Sex can just be really hilarious and silly and fun. That's okay. Um, yay, thanks. A little applause there. Yeah, yeah, sex can just be silly and that's fine. Um, so, okay, so suppose I got that manufactured. Well, there might be a few folks who would be interested in getting one, that's cool. But you know, not everyone wants a glowing penis. I, I don't really know why not. <laughs> But for some reason, this is not, in fact, everyone's bag. Um, and some people may not be able to afford it. So there's, there's a limit to like how much cool goodness I can do that way. But if I spend my time and energy building tools to help provide resources to all the other cool sex geeks who are out educating folks, making films, making toys, um, doing theater productions, we start to reach a lot more people. And hopefully some of those people will then turn around, start doing fun sex geek stuff, and they start reaching even more people. So my startup now, over the course of a couple years, um, I'm now reworking it as a nonprofit. And so we are gonna start providing a, a grant-making platform and resources to folks who are doing awesome sex-positive work. If that's something you're interested in contributing to, time, money, whatever, let me know. We're still in the pretty early stages. I made this decision like just a couple months ago. Um, if anybody's interested later, we can talk details. It makes some of the behind the scenes crowdfunding stuff much easier to do it this way, needless to say. So that's been the journey that I've taken. And so the responses that I've gotten have been really interesting. Uh, and I thought it would be fun to talk about. But first I wanna do a quick privilege check. So I need to acknowledge that I have a lot of privilege to be able to do what I do. The fact that I can use the name that's on my driver's license and stand up in public and say I like sex, I recognize a lot of other people cannot do that. Um, I have an amazing husband. I, you know, I'm white, I'm from an upper middle class background, I'm well educated, like I, I am so thankful for the life that I have. I recognize not everyone can, can do what I do, but I will try to use the privilege that I have to make the biggest impact in the world that I can, which I think is something a lot of people here also really strive for. Thanks, so that's, that's important to me, but I wanna like give a shout out, because I know not everybody can stand up here and be like, oh yeah, I love sex, let me tell you about it. So here we are. So in deciding to stand up and say, well yes, I like to have sex, let me tell you about it. Um, this has had consequences at a number of levels. For me, um, the biggest one was, I did a lot of work in robotics education, I will never work with K-12 students again. You laugh, but it's like, I, I had, that was, that was a career choice that I had to make. I actually enjoyed like working with kids. It was cool. I met a lot of really cool kids, um, but I will never do that work again because of the sex negative society that we live in. And that was, that was a choice I had to consciously make. Um, and so that was, that was like a, that was a big deal for me. It was, it was hard to like look and be like, oh, I was having, I was having this nice career over here. But then it was like, well, I, I really like sex. <laughs> and, and I wanted it to run in that direction instead. The other thing I have run into, yeah, the financial system, not very sex positive, it turns out. Um, I am fortunate, like, oh, so the first bank account that I started for my company, 30 minutes. It lasted 30 minutes. I filled out the application, they were very nice. I remained, you know, relatively vague about what I did. And then they looked at my email address, went to that domain, called me up and were like, is this your website? I was like, yeah. And I tried to come back in and talk about it. Yeah, nah, they didn't want to hear about it. It's like, okay. Yep, I wasn't totally, it still sucked. Like I wasn't totally surprised, but it still kind of sucked. So things like trying to deal with payment processing, trying to find banks that will work with me, that kind of thing. It's even worse for sex workers. Um, I've got, so Tina Horn, also local to New York, 
just had a great article in Vice about the impact of the financial system on sex workers. Um, it's disgusting. It just, it's really disgusting. And I'll post a link to that. So that's kind of another of these bigger societal things I have had to deal with. Um, so now at this point, before we go further along this line, I wanted to do a thought exercise. I thought this would be fun, get you guys psyched up again. It's, I know it's really hard to top a glowing penis, but I just have to kind of keep going. So here we go. So I'm gonna show you a flowchart. And when I am done presenting the flowchart, I want you, if you can, to kind of capture what your immediate reaction is. Try to make note of, of what you're thinking like when, when we're all through. We'll see how this goes. All right, box one. Have I already told you I would have sex with you before, during, or after this con? I will tell you the answer, no. So I will not have sex with you before, during, or after this con. This is a thing that I really struggled with um, because given some of the experiences I've had, I thought it would not hurt to be very clear. And so when you see this flowchart, if you notice what you are thinking, if your response is, what a bitch, she doesn't even know me. I, of course she would wanna fuck me. Um, that tells me something about boundaries and your sense of boundaries. I actually do get to stand up here and make declarations like this because I am a human being, and hopefully you will be decent and respect them. We'll see how that goes. Oh, thanks. Yeah. And so what I, one, the big thing I think I have learned in trying to do the, the sex positive geek thing is that boundaries get to be really interesting. And, and kind of an issue. So if I'm over here as sex geek culture hacker and I have some boundaries about kind of what I consider normal, respectable behavior, and I recognize other people are out there, they also have boundaries. Once you start talking in public about sex, some people can, can deal well with those boundaries and some people just kind of plow right through them. And I think part of that is because I'm talking about sex and I think part of it is because I look the way I look and I was raised as a woman. And that has had, that has made for some really interesting experiences. So we're gonna play a game of awesome or awkward. I'm gonna tell you about an experience that I had and we're gonna, we're gonna see whether that was awesome or awkward. Oh, jumping the gun a little bit over here. Now wait. So here's, here's the first one. These are some comments that I got when I posted the story of like the first time I had partnered penis and vagina sex. I'm really not fond of the term virgin. I think we have a whole nasty cult around virginity and what that means, and that's a bunch of bullshit. So the first time I had partnered sex, I posted that story, and these are some of the comments I got. This was awesome, right? People were sharing their stories. They were acknowledging we had had this common experience, this kind of, you know, how do you move from growing up in a really like sex negative environment to becoming sex positive and embracing your sexuality? That was awesome. This was, this was great, these were great messages to receive. And here's one. So I run a kinky maker meetup event at my maker space, like every other month. It's kind of like Dorkbot, right? It's like people playing with electricity and leather and wood and other things for kinky and fun purposes. So I run this event and during the event, I get a message from, from like J random guy I do not know. And he's like asking about the scheduling and I'm like, yeah, you know, we're still going, come on by. This was awesome, like yeah, I'm running an event, someone's interested in coming to my event, great, awesome. The next message I get from him is this, which ends up being kind of a really like weird like proposition. This is a dude I have never met. I have no idea who this guy is but he decided he would see if I was interested in doing some toy testing. And it's like, hmm, no, that's kind of awkward. And then the next message, and I see you're married, so feel free to relay that message to any women who might be there, as awful as that sounds, lol. <laughs> if you're telling me that it's awful, that's your clue right there. This was horrible. Um, I was like, wow, wow. I have these moments where it's like, oh, humans. <laughs> I cannot believe you sometimes. Um, so yeah, this, this was horribly awkward. And it, it's, it gets into that sort of objectification some, and some sort of boundary issues there. So that, that was not cool. Um, 
this is interesting. So I do wear my penis for demonstration purposes at conferences. This does happen. And every so often, someone will just come up to me and just touch my penis. Not cool. Don't touch other people's junk without asking. I feel that's a pretty reasonable rule across the board, regardless of whether it's, you know, made of silicone or not. Like, you know, and I actually had a guy like, like say, oh, I just can't help myself. And I'm like, really? <laughs> really? No. Um, and I have also had people that I did not know just come up and touch me. And it's, it can often be like older guys maybe. And you know, there's one thing for like offering me a handshake or like offering me a high five or like, do you want a hug? I'm, I'm cool, you know, offer, that's cool. But like, just like touching me, like, hey, you're like gonna come over here and get in my space and just touch me. It's weird. Um, and it's awkward. And I've realized in part that's not just because it's the one dude. It's because over his shoulder, he can't see. There's, there's the ghosts of all these other dudes who have done it and like the like thousands of years where men treated people like me like property where we couldn't actually control our own bodies and who got to touch us and who didn't get to touch us. So yeah, that is really awkward. Kind of my pro tip there is like, don't touch people without asking, especially not their junk, but just don't touch them in general. And like offer some contact, but if you don't know them, like just, just play it safe. Don't be awkward. Oh, yeah, like seriously. And I have heard, actually, I've heard of that happening at this conference. So like, yeah, yeah, be, be aware. This is another thing, okay. So I will be up at a conference talking about sex like I do, and you know, sometimes I get feedback. Great talk, that's cool. I get people asking about my toys or some of the experiences I've talked about. That is awesome. I, I love like talking with people about my work. Then sometimes, this, this is scumbag septagon again, I get, I get things like, you're hot. And, and I thought for a while, like why is that so awkward? And I think part of it is because it feels very objectifying, it feels very disrespectful. Like, I know you're really excited to tell me about what your groin is thinking. I'm not really interested. Like, that's not actually what I'm talking about. Um, the other thing is, you'll notice that these conferences are often like, they're basically public, right? If, if you can afford to get in, if you can get a ticket, like anybody who can afford a ticket can basically go. So then as far as I'm concerned, I might as well be standing in the grocery store looking at produce and you're coming up to me and being like, you're hot. It's like, what? <laughs> like, I don't have a relationship with you. I don't know you. Like, this, this isn't very helpful. Again, it, it feels like this weird kind of boundary violation of just like, you know, normal, respectful people kind of engaging with each other in normal, respectful ways. So that, is, that has been some of the, some of the things that I have, I have seen. So if we're talking about, you know, hacking this culture to make it sex positive, right? It's about sharing experiences and ideas, making things, getting people excited, but also there's this issue of boundaries and respecting them. Because if, if you decide that you want to start doing this kind of culture hacking and doing sex positive work sort of in a public way or at least a way that, that your friends can see or whatever, be aware that you're gonna need to set boundaries and you're gonna need to enforce them because they're gonna, there are gonna be folks who are just like, like whatever, and try to plow right through. Um, if this is not your bag, you're not necessarily yourself, um, interested in going out and doing this kind of public work, which is totally fine, this is not for everybody. But if you're interested in learning from these folks or asking them questions, um, being aware of those boundaries and being respectful of them is a good thing. And it's good because that's part of the culture that we want to have. Like that's part of the sex positive culture is, is looking for consent and respecting boundaries and that's, that's gonna be awesome. So real quick, I wanted to give a shout out to my husband who's amazing, all of my friends who support me doing the work that I do, um, my lawyer, Davis of Sexquire, who's awesome for my startup. I work with Melina Williams. She's a BDSM educator based out of New York. She does my social media. Um, the patron saint of this talk is Captain Awkward and the Awkward Army. Uh, if you haven't read Captain Awkward, like this, she, they, they really gave me the language to start thinking about boundaries and understanding sort of how people were relating to me and that was invaluable. I also wanna give a shout out to Cable Flame who has given awesome sex talks at Hope in the Past. When I was like, uh, should I propose this talk or not? Um, 
Cable Flame was super supportive and encouraging, and that was great. And of course, thanks to everybody at 2600, the staff and volunteers of Hope for making this possible so I can come out here um, and share this and share my work with all of you. I really appreciate it. So I, I unfortunately, I don't have my watch up on me. As out of 11.45, the notes and slides from this talk will go live on my website at uh, toymakerproject.com slash hope dash x. Um, so there's tons of links, tons of references, everybody who I've talked about, all the concepts I've talked about, there's links to all those things. Um, and yeah, so thank you guys very much for listening. I really appreciate this opportunity and I look forward now to hearing some of your questions and comments. Got the mic on? Great. Uh, hi there. Thanks. Um, fantastic talk. Um, Thank you. I've had an interest in this for some time, but kind of aside from being a, a maker, kind of mm -hmm. day job, um, the work that I've been doing, I've kind of focused in the sort of fetish community where it's been mm -hmm. quite well accepted. Um, how did you make the kind of the crossover to the more sort of mainstream audience? Oh, that's a really interesting question. So I think for me, part of it is, well, I, when I'm thinking about projects, I'm, I, part of it, you know, it just kind of comes from your own interests, right? And so for me, especially starting with like dildos, like that's just something I'm really interested in. Like that was yeah. like a toy that I could make that I was interested in and it turns out, well, yeah, a lot of other people are interested in that too. Um, I also, when I'm setting up events, try to be very inclusive in language and right. to let people know that it doesn't matter like what material you're interested in or what gender you are. Like I, I really try to be very open and um, and it's, yeah, I mean, it's not always easy. Cause like, yeah, I agree. I feel like within kind of the fetish BDSM community, you get a lot of like DIY. And so I'm, I'm trying to make an effort to kind of reach out to folks beyond that. And you know, with varying degrees of success. But part of it I think is, is kind of language and how you're framing it. And part of it is sort of what, what, um, what, what are you making? You know, and, right. and depending on what it is, that'll have a different community of folks who are interested. Excellent, thank you. Thanks. Hello. Uh, Hi. Thank you very much for this talk. Uh, it's a perspective that we don't really get enough. So thanks again. Uh, thank you. My question for you, um, I feel like this year in particular, I've been hearing about rape culture through my Facebook and stuff. And as a white guy, I was kind of blown away that it's a thing that half the population <laughs> knows is real and the other half <laughs> is denying it. And I'm like, am I part of the problem? So my question in particular is, in the geek community in particular, what's going on with us? <laughs> okay, well, I, I appreciate that question. That is probably outside of the scope of what I can talk to. Um, well, just your experience. Uh, well, so I'm honestly not entirely sure. I mean, part of it is, right, there are, there are jackasses in the world, but there are jackasses everywhere, right? There are jackasses who are geeks, there are jackasses who are not geeks, right? That's just kind of, that's just kind of it. Um, I think part of it is that, hmm, Geeks have, I feel like we have a lot of, I think part of, okay, so if you check out, say, the geek social fallacies, I think that's related, because there's a lot of things about not excluding people, not wanting to create drama, you know, we don't want to rock the boat, we want everyone to get along, so maybe it's harder to call out problematic behavior. Um, yeah, that's, that's a big question. Um, there is a really good article that I link to here called The Gentleman's Guide to Rape Culture, and I think that might have some good pointers for you on just, just things to be aware of. But yeah, no, I mean, I've run into friends. I, I'm friends with a guy who's like, like a bodybuilder, right? This guy is like massive. And he's like, yeah, he's like, my friend and I, another guy friend and I, we're like talking and we're like, oh, we, we realized that if a woman was riding the elevator with us, she might like notice that 
that there are these big guys with her. And then I was like, yeah, yeah, it's kind of a thing you notice. Um, so yeah, I appreciate, like, I think it's, thank you for, for standing up and asking that. I really appreciate that you, you want to be more aware. And yeah, I'm not, I'm not qualified to answer all the things, but, but maybe check out the Gentleman's Guide to Rape Culture and that will, will give you some clues. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, uh, this is not so much a question as just, um, I was thinking about your awkward versus awesome <laughs> slides, <laughs> and they were wonderful. Oh, thank you. Um, but I, I was thinking back to an article, and unfortunately, I couldn't find it. Uh, all of my devices have died. Oh, <laughs> my condolences. But um, mm. it was actually about just the same sort of situation, but just standing on a pla train platform with a stranger, and men forcing conversations with you, you that you don't really want to have. And you have to fight this game of, is, do I be polite? How do I walk away from this? I would like to not talk to you for 10 minutes without being really standoffish and rude. But it comes down to that awkward thing. And it's a really great article. If I can find it, I will tweet it to you. But oh, that would be great. Yeah, no, it was excellent and just about was how that, Was that, that Captain Awkward? I feel like Captain Awkward might have written something about that. I, you know, I didn't catch the name. It was somebody. But, but yeah, no, time. absolutely, right? It's but, it's this this weird thing of like, how do I enforce my boundaries? And we have a lot of societal crap around women sort of having boundaries and acknowledging where they are, like, uh, not just women, but like, you know, a, again, I was raised in the Midwest in a really conservative family. I was not taught to tell people to shut the fuck up, even when that's really what they need to yeah, do. Yeah, I was too, and I still have those bands. I know, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a struggle. It's right, a struggle. Well, thank you. Thank you. Oh, hello. Um, I have a question, particularly, it's like with the makerspace. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, it's like I kind of, it's like have, uh, well, I guess uh, this is an awkward moment for me. Uh, it's like I'm kind of curious, it's like how did you broach uh, the question, or it's like bring up the subject of making toys at it's like makerspace oh. because it's like one of the reasons it's like I got into electronics was to make toys, and mm -hmm. you know, it's like I would keep on going to makerspaces, and people would go over and say, Oh, well, uh, what project do you want to work on? and I'd go and say, I didn't have an idea, or Oh, I'd like to learn about motors, you know, it's like. <laughs> That's, that's a great question. So it, it will definitely depend on probably the flavor of the space and the people who you're working with. I have generally found, I, I have been very upfront about what I do. Um, you know, and so at least at my hacker space, kind of what you work on in your own space is pretty much your own business. There's not really too much that they're, they're gonna have to say there uh, really. Um, but yeah, so people would be like, what are you working on? I'm like, making a dildo. You know, and then you kind of gauge their reaction. Like some people will be like, oh, hey, yeah. And you know, other people are like, they give you the kind of awkward look and you're like, oh, no worries. And you go somewhere else. You're like, oh, so you know. So I, I don't try to force what I'm doing on people, but if people ask me what I do, I tell them what I do. And now I have the reputation as like the woman at the makerspace who makes sex toys and I get random people coming up and like, hey, hey. It's like, hey, I hear, I hear you make toys. And it's like, yeah, yeah, come on over. You want to see my prototypes? Are you interested in something? Can I tell you about silicone? Like, so it's, it, it kind of depends on your comfort level, their comfort level. Like, I don't try to force what I do on people. Um, but I'm honest. For me, I, I have learned I am happiest, if you can't tell, when I'm very open and honest about what I do. And so that's, that's worked okay for me. Your mileage may vary. Um, it got a little more complicated when I wanted to start the meetup group because I wanted to make sure that the hackerspace administration was like cool with that and you know how do we kind of sort that out but but they were pretty cool and I at least so far at least in at Artisans Asylum in Boston it's a really pretty open minded group of people and like once word got around that this is what I was doing then I started like people started coming out of the woodwork and be like oh well you know I built a prototype for that I'm like oh cool you know so you know just see what you're comfortable with um, but people, people may surprise you. Oh, thank you. Hi. Um, so I have two shout outs and also a question. Uh, I wanted to shout out, uh, St. James Infirmary, which is an organization in San Francisco that yeah. provides free healthcare services to sex workers. 
uh, and they're really amazing. And there's probably yep. similar organizations all over, but um, yep. I've done a little bit of work for them, and they're good people. The other uh, thing I want to shout out is a conference called Ars Electronica, yeah. which uh, is organized by somebody in this room. Yeah, Johannes. <laughs> Johannes here. Uh, yeah. And it's it happens every. It's a sex geek conference, and it happens every year, every approximately every year, yeah. uh, in San Francisco. And it's really worth checking out if you have the time. My question for you is, um, what do you think are some age-appropriate ways to teach consent culture? Because it seems like there's a, oh. there's, there are weird things that we put up with, in, like, like the stereotype of like, the child running around on the playground and like pulling the hair of the person that they have a crush on. And that's really fucked up culture to teach, actually. <laughs> right? What do you do with someone you like harass them? Right. <laughs> Um, that is a really great question. It is unfortunately beyond the scope of my work. Um, there is a blogger, and I will see if I can tweet this later and add it to the slides. There is like the sex positive parent. Um, so there are folks who are doing work exactly in this area, although I can't speak to it myself. But yeah, no, that's, that's absolutely a thing. It's like teaching people like, yeah, you don't run up and touch other people's junk. You don't run up and just pull people's hair. Not cool. Right. right. I so. mean, it seems like it, this would be more effective if we could teach this from a young age. Oh, absolutely. Of, absolutely. You got to, yeah, yeah. You really, like, you got to get them while they're young. Yeah, you right. want to teach them smart, good <laughs> habits at an age-appropriate level so that then later, like, you're telling this consistent story about consent and what consent means and how to have healthy relationships. Absolutely. So, yeah, sex-positive parent is one, and I'll work on getting links to that. Thank you. Thanks. Great question. Um, my question is actually, would be a good follow-up to that. Um, it's a little political in terms of, um, but we went to the same university, and I was really upset to find that university on the list of schools that dealt very poorly with sexual violence, particularly towards women. Um, and so I'm sad to hear that you're kind of out of helping with the education stuff, because I think there's a lot to be done above the K through 12 level oh, yeah. at the college level. And I'm wondering if you have any opinions on like how we can help change that culture as you know, people who have already graduated and left and we can't you know, be part of a protest on campus and we can't really force them to change. That's, oh, that's a really good question. Um, let me, th I'm like, oh, that's big, let me think. So part of it, things you might be able to do would be if you can connect with, so like more campuses have um, like sex weeks, things like that. Like if you can find kind of student groups, you might be able to connect with helping them like bring in speakers because there are a huge number of amazing like sexuality educators for one thing who are really passionate about, you know, do a lot of speaking with college students, really passionate about this kind of work. Um, again, I'm sorry, this is not, not totally my purview, but yeah, I appreciate it. It's definitely a problem. Um, and yeah, I'll do some more digging to see if I can find specific people um, to maybe kind of point you to whose work might be more relevant. But yeah, there's, it's a huge issue, and absolutely I appreciate that, that you're concerned, because yeah, it's, it sucks. It's a big deal. Thank you. Thank you. So during your talk, you mentioned how difficult it was to, um, to muster financial, uh, financial, not even backing, just financial acceptance. Yeah, like in just infrastructure? Yeah, just, just basic somebody who was willing to hold your dollars until you needed them. For everybody who may have come out of this inspired to make, for example, the, the three-armed rotating dildo or whatever, right? And need yep. some, those people who need somewhere to put their dollars, how did you solve that problem? Uh, I don't have a great solution at the moment. If you're an individual, the Internet Archive has a credit union, and the Internet Archive is remarkably open-minded. They're amazing, it's Believe true. it or not. So if you're an individual, getting an account at the Internet Archive credit union is actually pretty cool. They're like, as long as you are not doing anything illegal, we don't care. If you're a business, it's a little more complicated, and that I don't have a great solution to at this point. So basically, the, the yaks too far are like <laughs> the sex-positive financial institution, and the sex positive insurance pool for like event organizers. Like anybody out there, free idea, money to be made, huge community that needs that, that kind of service. Um, so yeah, I'm still working on it. If that's a thing you're interested in, you know, keep up with me. 
Um, and as I like find solutions, I will be sh like shouting them to the hills. Because one of the things my nonprofit will hopefully do is have a directory where we can be like, oh, you're looking for, yeah, the bank where you can park your money, or you need a lawyer, or you need, you know, whatever, trying to make that more accessible so people starting companies can work with providers who are happy to work with them. Because, um, yeah, it's, it's not an easy thing. So, thank Kristen, you. Kristen, you are doing great work. <laughs> thank you very much. All right, I've got two minutes left, so I have time for another question. So you, um, early in the talk, you talked about how you'd had to give up your K through 12. And I'm wondering if, have you given this something like this talk in Europe or Japan or someplace where things are a little different and did people react? Quizically. Oh, that's, that's a great question. No, I have actually not had the opportunity to, to do the sex positive stuff outside the US. Like, hmm, <laughs> like, I should look into that. Yeah, that, that would be really, I'm like, research, science needs to be done. Comparative reactions of audiences to the hammer in different, <laughs> different regions of the world. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, so that, that is a great question and I would love to find out the answer, <laughs> absolutely. I, I think the hammer seems very cool, and uh, on a related note, I, there's a Kickstarter that started for, you've heard of it, the K-Goal, which yes. is the Fitbit for Kegel exercises. Yes, I'm, I'm I super think, psyched. I think you may have inspired something, I think. I, I don't know. I don't know the people at Minna. Um, so they're a company in San Francisco, yes. The Kegel, and if you look back on my Twitter feed, it's, it's in there somewhere. Yeah, it's totally, it's a Kegel exercise trainer that actually gives feedback like to your smartphone and you can do like an exercise training program. And I'm like, that's awesome because Kegel exercise is effing boring. But they are, they are selling it as, or at least it's packaged not as a toy at all. It's just like, this is for your health. Health yes. is important. And I was looking at it, I was like, I'm betting Kickstarter isn't fond of toys, and that's why this we'll, is a health thing. We'll see. Um, yeah, these days, like, um, I know a couple of people that ha are running, like, sex toy campaigns and have not been taken down yet. So it could be... The other thing is, sex toys are actually in a different category than porn. Um, like, I'm not a lawyer. My understanding of the word from my lawyer is that sex toys are often not considered obscene, whereas pornography is. So I can believe that if you have, and it's mostly down to payment processors, you've got somebody that's unhappy with porn, they may still be okay with sex toys. So yeah, it's, it's kind of complicated. Um, but if you're interested, follow up with me later. Thank you again, everybody, for coming out. I really appreciate it. I hope you had fun. Slides are up. I'll be around the con all day tomorrow. Thank you very much. <laughs>